In this video, we're going to talk about what happens if you attach springs uh, in parallel or in series. This is intuitively related and mathematically related to how resistors in an electrical circuit work in series and parallel. Uh, so let's think about this. If I have two springs in parallel, imagine pulling on those a plate attached to those two springs. The spring constant of those springs is going to be additive. It's going to be harder the more springs I put behind that plate to pull it forward. Uh, this is opposite how like a box spring mattress works. So if you put a bunch of springs together, you get an additive spring constant so they can hold up the weight of a person because there's a bunch of springs there lying in parallel. And you can just imagine trying to pull on those springs would make it harder. For springs attached in series, you're always going to have the weakest link effect, first of all. So your spring constant uh, small, it has to be smaller than the weakest spring because if you imagine attaching a bunch of slinkies together, in fact you could do that intuitively in your mind, imagine tying a bunch of slinkies together is pulling on that set of slinkies harder or easier than pulling on one slinky? And the answer is that it's going to be easier the more that you attach in series. That's an intuitive explanation. Um, you can look up the math derivation behind that if you wanted to, but intuitively, attaching springs in series makes them overall weaker, and attaching springs in parallel makes them overall stronger. And like I said, this is going to work very similarly to uh, circuits. So if we're saying that K1 and K2 get stronger, or the set K1, K2 is stronger, then these would add, so let's call this uh, K parallel equals K1 plus K2. And then K series, um, I'm just going to make up some numbers or some variables here. So if I have two springs in series, that would be K1 inverse, K2 inverse, and then you would have to take the inverse of that whole thing. So that's, um, just to be clear, what I've drawn down here, or what I've written down here is for if we had K1 attached to K2 like this. So with those two equations, we can now solve this problem at hand. I'm going to erase this and move to a different slide. Now we have the math to solve this problem. Okay, so let's look at these first two in parallel. And these will be, oops, I even erased my K2. K1 plus K2. So now imagine that as one new thing. So our K uh, resultant or K effective, if I'm thinking about that, a resistor analogy would be 1 over k parallel plus 1 over k3 inverse. So now if I make that substitution here and try to simplify as far as I can, things start to look like uh, this. this is right out the next step, and I'm probably going to need a new page. So K3, KP, over K3, plus KP. So that's just working this out uh, by finding common denominators and then converting when I'm done. And this will go to, uh, if we now sub in what KP is. So I wrote KP, I didn't make the substitution. It's going to be K3 times K1 plus K2 over K3 plus K1 plus K2. So that is the resultant spring constant. And now for one last trick, um, which I'm going to flip the page for, so this all will go away, we can then calculate the frequency of oscillation. So omega, in general, is square root of k over m for spring constant and mass. Um, now I just need to substitute in that k that we found a second ago. And if I make that substitution, this is what I get. That was literally just plugging in k, uh, nothing fancy there. But that is how you would find the frequency of oscillation for a spring system. 
And just like for series and parallel circuits, the trick is always just find a small set that's easy to work with, do that, and then do the next set. So you can do this for arbitrarily large systems just by saying, okay, these two springs look like they're in parallel, let's do that. And now that set with this other one is in series, so let's do that, and so forth and so on.